Good morning. Would you please stand and sing with us? God, we thank you so much for this day and for this opportunity that we can come here and gather together to worship you. Lord, we pray today that you would just open our hearts and open our minds so that we could worship you and receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
would you please turn and greet one another? United Methodist. My name is Joe Kate. I'm the pastor here. We're so grateful that you've joined us together. We're so grateful that Caitlin is back. We're glad to have Caitlin back. <laughs> Caitlin is feeling better. She's a physical therapist. She lists people all the time and is at risk to hurt her back. She's feeling better and is um, back with us. We're grateful for that. We're also grateful for the fact that band members are so interchangeable. I bought a um, screwdriver at Home Depot that has like eight different points on it that all stay on the screwdriver so you don't have to find them. So like if your license plate is a flat or a Phillips and you want to change it, you can change that out. Or like six other things, I don't know what you would do with them. <laughs> Mostly just the flat and the Phillips is all I need. But each band member is so interchangeable in their ability to lead or participate. We're grateful for that as well. Um, uh, whenever any one of them is missing, the other ones uh, pick it up. Grateful for that. We like to frame our announcements in our five practices. Um, that We try to live these out on Sunday morning and throughout the week. The first of which is radical hospitality. If you're um, new today, we're grateful that you came. We hope you feel welcome. We have a secure security check-in station for your children if they're elementary school age or below. We have snacks here and restrooms here. Uh, I want to tell you, give you an update on our um, security on campus. Uh, we mentioned last week that um, in Greer there's been an elevation in, in many churches of not people wanting to worship coming in uh, that are new, but people who intend to uh, take something from churches to hope to find weak spots. And so uh, we've taken a measure, I hope, that won't weird you out, but will help us to be um, as friendly as possible while being as safe as possible. And that's to have an off-duty officer just around our campus. Our trustee can catch them very quickly. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't want to welcome you and, and welcome anyone who walks in the door. We just want to be safe. And actually, if we have any sort of other event health-wise, um, we can reach that person as fast as possible. We have prayer cards. If you'd like to participate in our prayer ministry, if you'll simply raise your hand. An usher will bring you a prayer card and you can um, just share any kind of concern uh, and it will be shared with our Tuesday prayer group. We want to make sure that you know that. And, um, every time, I think I'm going to call on Aaron. She's right there. Um, I'm going to call on Aaron for an, another couple of announcements about Radical Hospitality. Thank you, Joe. I'm Erin Knight, Director of Children and Family Ministries, and I just want to first remind you that our first Supper, of six, Supper at Six of the Fall is coming up. Uh, next Sunday is the last day you can register for that. You can read the menu and details in your bulletin, but if you'll just sign the roster as it come by, comes by today to say how many you would like to sign up, uh, we would love to have you. And um, while it is a... Um, Thunderbird square dance themed uh, night. Don't let that deter you if you'd rather be a viewer than a dancer, but I hope some of you will come out and enjoy that dancing. Uh, also, um, the youth have a game night kickoff tonight. Did you want to say a word? Youth kickoff tonight. We don't have programming for any other age group, but the youth have, uh, what's, it, what's it called? Gunk ball. Uh, so it's kiddie pools that are at bases like baseball, and those kiddie pools are filled with nasty, nasty stuff uh, that we bought yesterday. And we'll play baseball in those with those kiddie pools as bases. That starts at five o'clock tonight. And um, all those youth that will be promoted up today, we're excited to have you, and uh, hope you come out tonight at five o'clock. Well, next we strive to practice passionate worship. And um, if you will go forward one slide, we're doing something a little different for our baptism today, and this is what we'll do going forward. First of all, many of you have heard of the glass that has been turned into crosses um, that used to hang in the windows of Memorial United Methodist, so I think that's really special. We've made slightly smaller ones for baptisms, and a child will get that when, or, or adult, I guess, we hadn't come to that, but it, we'll get one when they're baptized. But also in your bulletin today, you will see a little insert, Sacrament of Baptism for Abigail Wright Smith. So what we would like to ask you all to do is write a little prayer, a message, anything that you feel comfortable with to Abby so that she knows how much we love her and how proud we are of her um, getting baptized today. And we'll collect those in the collection plate and give those to her family. 
also um, something new coming for the fall for passionate worship for children, uh, starting September 10th, we will have Children's Chapel. Uh, so the second Sunday of the month, kindergarten through second graders will come with me for a little time where we'll worship together and really study um, how worship works, learn some things that they may not understand, and um, focus on some Bible skills um, during the sermon. And they'll be called out and they'll be walked to Sunday school after. Um, and then the fourth Sunday, we'll do that with third through fifth graders. And that group, of course, is able to do much more in terms of reading their Bible and learning elements of worship and even participating in worship. So they will get to practice that at an age-appropriate level. I'm really excited to do that. I'm looking forward to kicking it off. Uh, we strive to practice intentional faith development. Uh, today is Promotion Sunday. So all of you who have been saying, do I get to go up to my new class yet? Um, yes, today you do. <laughs> um, we'll miss our... Um, Rising, our sixth graders now that left um, the children, but they have all signed their name to one of the painted fishes in the uh, straight room uh, so that we have a mark that they were there um, and they will start youth today. Um, everyone should go to the grade level classroom for this school year except um, K-5 um, if they will wait in their preschool Sunday school, I'm going to walk them all up. It may take me a minute with all the things happening today to get there, but I'm coming to walk them up so they feel special being promoted upstairs. And then those those receiving Bibles today will be in a special class, so they'll join their regular group in two weeks. Um, one other thing under intentional faith development, we are having a Spark House Children's Book Fair. Um, it's actually going to be downstairs on September 10th and 17th, but if you aren't going to be here then or if you are curious about those books, they're all set up in the straight room. You can take a look, take a registration form, uh, a order form, and order them at any time. These books are um, a Christian uh, publisher, and the deal is I get 10 free books for our church library every time I do one of these, and they're great books. I already use them. Um, you all get a chance to buy them and give them to your children, grandchildren, um, and then we get to keep 20% of those sales for our children's ministry. So it's really a great um, opportunity, and I hope you'll check that out. Thank you. If you look uh, as the attendance register goes by, we like to use that during the school year for registrations. The UMW, uh, uh, United Methodist Women, are having a fall luncheon, and they've asked me to ask you, if you're going to register for that, go ahead and put it in the attendance register as it goes by. We do the same thing with the dinner. You just out from your name, put the event, whatever it is, and put the number of people that are going to attend. Uh, we believe in extravagant generosity. And that is why there is a sheet in your chair or in the chair beside you. I want you to pick up that sheet just for a second. Our nominations committee is looking at 2018 and what we want to do with the leadership in 2018. And we want to give you the opportunity to express your interest. Um, the, uh, our leadership is really, really thin right now for two reasons. Uh, one is we haven't emphasized it near enough. Um, two years ago we were very thin and I haven't made it better. And we're going to make it better this year for 2018 by giving you the opportunity to serve. So there's a brief description of what the item is. There's a um, almost, almost locked in timeline. I'm, I'm almost sure when it says that's when it is, that's when it will be to give you a sense of uh, when meetings will be and when you could be available. And I'd like you, if you're uh, willing to to put your name and the date and circle a thing that you're interested in. Uh, we want to emphasize that you circling that you're interested in it doesn't mean, okay, now you're locked in for the next seven years. It means I've expressed my interest in this thing and our group that puts together leadership for 2018 will take that into advisement. Uh, so I appreciate your um, participation in that. So that's our announcements for today. Let's um, pray together before we have a, a special presentation. Lord, we've gotten here. We've taken uh, all the necessary steps of getting up, getting dressed, maybe eating breakfast, eating breakfast in this space. We've gathered everyone. We've put them in the car. We've got to this space. Lord, as we are here, help us, Lord, to transition to being here, to being fully present for your prayers, for your songs, for your scripture, for your proclamation. Help us be present, Lord, that you can call us in this service to leadership in your name. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to call Erin right back up as the children's director, and then she's going to transition to being a parent uh, for this important presentation.
So today we are presenting our Bibles to children. Uh, these typically go to third graders, but we had one um, child who has joined us since his third grade year um, that will join us as well. Um, so I want to say congratulations to Brock and Claire on receiving your Bibles today. This is an important day as we recognize your maturity and ability to study this most important book on your own. We give this Bible to you for personal, intentional faith development and as a symbol of your potential for spiritual growth. You're receiving a very special Bible. It's the award-winning Deep Blue Common English Bible. It contains the entire text of the Bible in the Common English Bible translation, along with explanations and sidebars design, excuse me, designed to encourage a child's understanding. The CEB was built by the collaborative effort of 120 Bible translators, more than any translation before it, from 24 denominations and 500 Bible readers of diverse backgrounds in hundreds of different churches. Using words and phrases that sound natural and conversational, it's a balanced, accurate, and sensitive translation that mirrors how people talk, read, and right. Phil Vischer, creator of the, show, of the children's program What's in the Bible, says of the Bible, it's the best-selling, most influential book in history. It has been banned, burned, smuggled, fought for, lived for, and even died for, and yet many of us hardly even know what's in it. I promise to help you begin to learn what's in the Bible, but even more importantly, to learn to think about the kind of life the Bible calls you to lead. This is an exciting journey to understanding you will be on for your entire life. John Wesley preached about sanctifying grace, a continual process of being made perfect in our love of God and each other, making us free of our desire to sin. We will always fall short of perfection, but our love of God inspires us to be as close to God as possible, to know God as best we can, to seek to understand what God wants us to do in every circumstance. Your Bible is an important part of that journey. Knowing and understanding it means better knowing and understanding God. This book has changed the world, changed hearts, and changed lives. May you be richly blessed in your efforts to know and understand it. Congregation, we invite you to participate by following along on the screen. You will respond at the end of our liturgy. At this time, I would like to call Brock Keller and Claire Knight and their families up front. There are responses by the family and there are responses by the congregation very similar to um, uh, baptism and uh, joining in new membership. So if y'all will participate as you see. Actually, have y'all come out. Well, no, you're right. Face the congregation. Claire Rosalind Knight and Brock Andrew Keller received the word inspired by God. Learn its stories and study its words. Its stories belong to us all and these words speak to us all. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another for we are people of God. Will your families pledge to read and study the Bible together? If you'll respond on the screen. We will. We receive these Bibles with our hands, our hearts, and our minds. Congregation, if you'll help me respond to the families. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you, your family, and us as you use this Holy Bible in your home in your church school classes, and in our worship. We will learn together and grow in our love for God's Word. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you, your family, and us as you use this Holy Bible in your home, in your church classes, and in our worship. We will learn together and grow in love for God's Word together. y'all express your appreciation. You may be seated. Let us pray together. Lord, 
the Bible can be confusing. It can be complicated. It can be intimidating. But help us, Lord, in our intentional faith development, in our worship, in our Sunday school classes, and in our homes to dedicate ourselves to understanding it. Not to gain what we want, not to wield power or authority, but to be faithful disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. As we look at our text today about being truly human, remind us, Lord, of the weakness of our humanity, but of the amazing potential in your call for us to be leaders. Inspire us this morning, Lord, as we pray the prayer your Son taught His disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we're going to talk about building on the rock. Peter's amazing declaration of who Jesus was and exactly what that means to us. Matthew 16, starting with verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So your first uh, major point is son of man. This is a significant phrase that you find in the Bible. You'll see different translations that have different versions of this phrase. The Common English Bible, as um, Aaron suggested, tries to use as common a language as there is while remaining faithful to what the original message was. So you see the word son, or the phrase son of man. We're talking about a man who was born of a humble, unwed teenage girl. A man born of a simple carpenter, yet to be married to that teenage girl. A man born in a stable, and almost immediately on the run. And on the run for an extended amount of time for his very life. His family from the very beginning, even before he was born, is running around ho just hoping to find a spot that works. I don't know about uh, different trips that you've taken. Whatever logistics that you had planned just didn't work out in the slightest. Or you just left and hoped that it worked out. And all kinds of things got in the way. All kinds of things impeded you. There wasn't any vacancy in whatever it was. You couldn't find the right place. You couldn't find the right restaurant. You couldn't find your plane ticket. couldn't find whatever. Those brief moments of logistical total fear can be unsettling to us and we talk about them for decades the way we felt in that moment. This man was born in a time and in a place and with a family that was on the run for their very lives for years. A man born in Nazareth, raised in Nazareth, not a glowing reputation, and so this man, who was a human being, the Son of God became a human being and experienced human frailty. And when we read our Gospels, we read nothing of his adolescence. Any of you uh, mature much, much later in your life? Any of you would take a long, long time for you to click into who you are and what you wanted to be? don't have any idea if it took Jesus a while to mature into what he wanted to be. But we have no record of it. And so a simple baby born to simple parents in a simple town on a run from complicated people is the very son of God. 
So when that is uh, uh, laid out there, it's the significance of us being human, of us understanding what it's like uh, to be that uh, Savior with our human frailties. The next phrase is qualities we see. Peter says, he says, who do, who do people think I am? And in any field of um, education or politics or sports or the, uh, uh, ministry, people see a young person coming up and they naturally compare that young person to some established person. Right? And say, this is the next whomever that is based on a particular skill set. Peter says three particular people, John the Baptist, Elijah, and Jeremiah. John the Baptist immediately preceded Jesus. Elijah and Jeremiah are in the Old Testament, but all three are prophets. And prophets have a very difficult job. Prophets are called to understand what God wants and to look at humanity and say, Whoa, we need to change what we're doing entirely or we need to stop doing nothing and do something or we need to recover our nation or we need to recover our faith. Prophets call people to attention. And those three are quite different. John the Baptist more than anything said, repent. All of you need to repent. You aren't close to what you were supposed to be doing and I need you to turn around and become faithful servants. Elijah challenged authority unlike any other. And in some cases won, and in some cases had to run for his life as well. So one calling people, repent, turn around. One saying to total authority, you're not even close to what you need to be. And finally, Jeremiah, deeply sad, as he saw his nation turning into ruin. Deeply broken at the current state of humanity. So do you see those three people in what we've read about Jesus all summer long? Y'all need to be better. Y'all need to be more focused. Y'all need to be more thoughtful. Y'all need to not answer to the typical authorities that you see in life. But need to answer to a much higher authority. And as Jesus goes into Jerusalem in the final third of his life, he looks around and he says, oh, this is supposed to be a holy city and it's broken. And do you think that's a new thing? Do you think that was a thing that existed just back, just back there where he was? Mm -hmm. you know, if you're lucky enough to go to the Holy Land, you visit churches occupied by different strands of the Christian faith who argue deeply with one another and sometimes hate one another for their differences. And they establish that hate in the worship space as visitors are coming through. You ever see somebody that gets really upset in church and you go, man, we're in church, we need to settle down. These different faith traditions, some of which have incense and some of which hate incense, will worship with one another in the same space and the ones with incense will go right to the edge of their worship space and throw it at them. I'm serious. A thing designed to draw people closer and establish what the space should be is used as a weapon of y'all aren't close to what you need to be. So Jesus sees Jerusalem. He would see it then. He would see it today. He'd see it thousands of years ago and say, man, there's a lot of brokenness in this humanity. And there seems to be a great deal of brokenness in the religious leadership of this humanity. And so when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Peter says, well, some people see John the Baptist. Some people see Elijah. Some people see Jeremiah. These men are dynamic. They're fearless. And they're passionate about their nation and their God. And that's what Peter is saying about Jesus in this moment. But finally he says your last phrase. You're the Messiah. You ever heard the phrase chosen one? Pop culture loves that phrase. 
Sports love that phrase. Religion loves that phrase. But if you're talking about the Messiah, who the Messiah is in this particular context, you're talking about um, what they figure is a conqueror of nations, an anointed leader, a deliverer of Israel, and a worthy ruler of the people. So when Peter says, you're the Messiah, what do you think the expectations are of the disciples and the people surrounding Jesus? We're going to win again. We're going to get these other nations out of our territory. We are going to be dominant leaders. We are going to be in control. Because isn't that where most of the brokenness comes that we're talking about? The supreme desire to want to be in control of what's happening. So when Peter says, you're the Messiah, huge deal. And this is how Jesus responds. Verse 17. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So the first phrase from that section is the rock. You ever see, um, if you, you Google it when you go home, pictures of every pope. They have them in Israel, but you can find it on Google Images. And it's every pope that's ever existed in the history of the Catholic Church. You know who the first one on the list is? Peter. Peter is the first one that he hands over the reins to. He says, you're going to be the rock. What does it mean that Peter just said, you're the one that reminds us of every um, uh, prophet we've ever seen? You're the one that reminds us of all these special qualities of a leader in God. And then Jesus says, I'm glad you noticed that. By the way, you're going to be the rock on which this church is built. Such a perfect quality and such a perfect thing for me handing out these uh, potentially interested in leadership sheets to you. Because so often pastors will say, it's tough to get leadership. It's tough to get people who want to participate. You know what might be the toughest thing in terms of pastors with that? Saying, here, you can hold this. You can hold it. And you can, uh, this is my dream for it, but I'm, I'm going to let you do it. <sighs> Why is that hard for pastors? I don't know. We, um, we're too focused on um, that tiny detail that we hope is right. We're too fearful. Um, I, would, I hope that this is my number one fear. If there's a pie chart of fears of handing leadership over to people that I don't, I feel like everyone works so hard outside off this campus that I feel uh, something like guilty for saying, hey, can you do this too? That's goofy, isn't it? Because when somebody in the community or someone, uh, uh, the YMCA or Great Community Ministries or whatever says, hey, would you like to be on our leadership team? What do I say? Oh, that's cool. That's an honor to participate. You'd think if I felt that, then I would turn around and say, would you like the honor of participating in leadership here at Memorial? But I struggle. He says, you are the Messiah, the one who is chosen to lead us to the place where we're going to be. And then Jesus says, perfect. Now you're going to be the one that we build this church on. What? This is the first indicator to me that they should have that Jesus is not going to be with them forever. But you know how someone is telling you something important that has about six details and you only hear about two of them? Why is that? Attention span? Cell phone? 
blocking out whatever pain that is about going to find a particular sauce at the grocery store that has this but doesn't have that. And you think, there's no way I'm getting that right. I'm not, I can't even pay attention. Whatever it is, you miss that detail. And then three weeks later when your loved one says, hey, you remember when I said we were going to do this? And what do you say? What? And they say, uh, we talked about this. In fact, pull up your calendar. It's on your calendar. Even though it's on our calendar, sometimes we miss it. Why? Just not dialed in. Jesus says to Peter, you're going to be the rock on which this church is built. Which is a clear indicator that Jesus is not going to be with them forever. The next phrase is the keys to the kingdom. This is why... If you Google St. Peter at the pearly gates, you'll see all kinds of cartoons. Some of which are safe for children, some of which are not. Just telling you, because I did it last night to see. <laughs> this is why you have the caricature of Jesus, of um, St. Peter at a gate. Who's people coming up to the gate and him saying, hmm, I don't know. You think that's what that phrase means in that moment? There, there's no way to know for certain. But in my opinion, he's saying to him, the kingdom of God, when he says the kingdom of God is near, John the Baptist says it, with Jesus being present there. He is giving Peter the right to emphasize what matters and what does not matter in the life of the church, in the life of faith, in the walk with Christ. Do you know that Peter was a fisherman? Do you know that he's not a deep, theological thinker. Now, he's had, he went from not thinking about it too much, more than likely, to a doctor degree in terms of experience in being around Jesus. But the people who have dedicated their entire lives and education and profession, who are determining what matters and what does not in Jerusalem in terms of the faith, would not necessarily recognize Peter as the one who's now determining what is tightened what is loosened. So the thing you want to ask yourself is, do I tighten things and do I loosen things in terms of my faith? Y'all want to know the answer? Uh-huh. You think some things are more important than other things in terms of your faith. And I think in many cases, people, when they have different opinions from other people, say, well, you know, that's your thing. If you think the only way to serve is in mission, and you think the only way to serve is in prayer? Well, I'm glad there's both of us. But then there's people who think, what are you, an idiot? You think that's the thing that you're supposed to emphasize? No, this is the thing that you're supposed to emphasize. And that debate is at fever pitch when Jesus is around because he's not following all the customs and traditions of the leadership of that time. Because he doesn't think they're as important. So he says to Peter, you have the keys to the kingdom. Is that really cool or really frightening? What if you were given those keys? How would you behave? How would you behave with people that you know? How would you behave with people that you like? How would you behave with people that you do not like? How would you behave with people that you outright despise? These are the questions we'd have to ask ourselves as the keys to the kingdom are handed over to a human being. And that's the next phrase. Given to a human. We're going to do what? You know, Peter thought that it was really amazing that Jesus was walking on the water towards them. And he said, I'd like to walk on the water. Call me out to you. What? If it's you. Jesus calls him out and he takes a step on the water and maybe another step. And then he looks around and he sees the storm swirling around him and he sees the boat two steps behind him now. And what does he do? Freaks out falls down into the water and says, Lord, save me. When soldiers come for Jesus in Jerusalem, 
I never think about the disciples having swords or having some sort of weapon. You know what he does to the soldier that comes to get him? Swipes at him. Cuts his ear off. In total anger that he was coming for Jesus. As Jesus is going by on the path with the cross... And people are sort of standing around, uh, maybe a couple of, you know, you, you know, there's always you know, this person that's right on the road, and then this person that's looking around them, and then this person that's doing this, and I'm always standing in the back, I can see that's one upside of being tall. I can see what's happening. There's people over here, and they're saying, hey, you're with Jesus, right? I feel like I've seen you with him. What does Peter say? Mm-mm. Someone else says, uh... No, I'm almost certain. I've seen you with him. Peter says what? Never heard of the man. No idea. So he sinks in the water. He reacts violently. And he denies he ever knew Jesus. You're giving this guy the keys to the kingdom. Sometimes he has a lack of focus. Sometimes he has a lack of patience. Sometimes he has a lack of conviction. Y'all ever struggle with those? Do you ever struggle with a lack of focus? Some people say that the digital age has caused us to be less focused than we've ever been before. You think that's right? Probably depends on your generation. But Jesus says time and time again, this is what we're going to do and how the disciples do retaining it. (laughs) There's no technology. In 1970, when parents said to their children, this is what we're going to do, do you think think children struggled to understand what they were saying? Mm -hmm. In 1931, when a wife told her husband, this is where we're going to go, do you think he struggled to understand and remember? (laughs) Yep. Yeah, I'm almost going to guarantee it. We struggle with focus. If I were sitting out there with you right now, I probably, would have, I probably would have thought of three particular things that were coming this week. And something would have drawn me back in, hopefully, to what the minister was saying. We struggle with a lack of patience with people that we know and love and cherish. We get tired of them. We say, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? Why are you moving that? Why did you buy that? Whatever it may be. We get tired of co-workers. You did what to the printer? Oh, your Wi-Fi's not working? Oh, you forgot to do the report that we were supposed to share and what we were doing? Oh, great. Do we get tired of church people? No. No, we love each other. We're always bros. We're always friends, right? Or do we get tired of church people? Mm Mm-hmm. We have a lack of patience and mercy. Sometimes we lash out. We talked about that last week on social media. I don't know how often we deny that we know Jesus There's probably times that we don't bring it up in a way that's convenient for what we're up to. Right? So all of us struggle with these struggles that Peter has, plus others. Lack of focus, lack of patience, lack of conviction. Yet tasks are given to us as they were given to Peter. Human beings. How could that be? when we battle inconsistency all the time. It's your last phrase. God needs humans. You ever think, God doesn't need me. I don't have anything to offer. I don't have anything that I can do. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough purpose. I don't have enough faith. That God even exists. If you're asking yourself those things or saying those things to yourself or saying those things to other people, you are in the perfect window for being called into major leadership in the life of faith because that's exactly where people were when God called them. 
Mary was just going to go get some water. <laughs> You're going to have a baby. And he's going to be the Messiah. Moses had a great spot way out in the wilderness where nobody even knew who he was. Building a family. Once every while thinking, you know, I murdered someone, that wasn't great. And then trying to move on. And out there in that wilderness, he's called to come back into the major city and lead people out. Peter, even given his brokenness before this moment in the Gospels, and with a pretty solid forecast that he's going to have brokenness going forward in the Gospels, Jesus says, you're going to be the rock upon which I build my church. A human being. God needs humans. How does God feel about humanity? Depends on who you ask. Every one of us might have a different answer, but I think it's biblical to say God is eternally hopeful for human beings. Why do we keep getting opportunities? Why do we keep getting called? Why do we keep getting placed in such interesting situations in which our faith can be a basis for a conversation with another person. God is eternally driven to press us beyond what we think we're capable of. You know, when I was 21, I would go to lunches. I was single. And I would go to church functions because I was a pastor. And women from the church would wrap up, I'd say, a good 16 boxes of food and put it in my trunk for me to take home. And I would take those boxes of food home and put them in the refrigerator. And every four and a half months, my mom would come and she'd look in the refrigerator and she'd say, what are all these boxes in here? Some of them are nasty. Sometimes I would do a great job of eating it, sometimes I wouldn't. But I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. You know what my pantry looks like now? One shelf is breakfast, one shelf is lunch, one shelf is dinner. And I thought about alphabetizing it left to right. <laughs> like the apps on my iPhone. There's potential for elevation in any aspect of your life. Not to insanity, like me in that particular image. But to a new chance of being a new person. Called to do a new thing. You know why? Because God needs humans. God needs you. God trusts in you. And God will build upon you in order to build the church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you are hopeful for the future of our lives. We're grateful that you press us beyond what we figure we can do. We're grateful for the chance to serve. And we ask you to give us just a little nudge forward. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand and join me in our modern affirmation found on the screen. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all His works, and whose will is directed to His children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of God fulfilled. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, reminding us always of the truth of Christ, our inspiration and strength in times of joy and sorrow. We believe our faith should be apparent in our words of love and acts of service, that the kingdom of God may be a present reality here on earth. You may be seated. It's now time for our offering, and you can give as the plate goes by, or you can give online with instructions in the bulletin.
please stand and sing this last one with us?
great week.